I'm not sure this was by design, but this juxtaposition of love and love in a different form. This juxtaposition of a claim and a claim in a different form is a juxtaposition we'll be experiencing throughout this evening and throughout the day tomorrow. It is the juxtaposition of this moment. And we are so, so honored to have all of you here with us for this experience to learn together, to live together, to love together, to be real with each other, and to, well, live like citizens. I am uh, very honored to be here as the co-founder of Citizen University. And uh, on behalf of our entire remarkable team of staff and volunteers, um, I want to welcome all of you uh, to the kickoff of the 2016 National Conference here at Citizen University. I am so moved by your presence. And what I wanted to do this evening, actually, is to speak very briefly about the setting, about the scene that we're in right now, uh, and then to say a word just about how the rest of this evening and the rest of the day tomorrow are going to unfold. This setting, this moment, there are a bunch of ways to describe this moment, and one is to say that this is the, I think, the 11th year now that we've had a conference like this in this space. And there are many things when you do something 11 times over that become muscle memory. Many ways in which, uh, you know, some things get easier in the production of a big gathering like this, uh, but also, as happens with any kind of thing repeated over and over again, uh, you become a little desensitized, right? And it's uh, a little easy for me, seeing a room like this, for a moment, to think, okay, this is version 11.0 of a room full like this. But hearing Nikita, hearing Grace and Jimmy, and just knowing the moment that we're in, makes me realize very viscerally that this is different from the previous 10 years. We're in a different time right now. This is a different day. And that is not only because of all of the unprecedented chaos of the 2016 presidential election and what's happening in our national politics, although that is probably one of the most vivid instantiations of it and the, and the object of our fascination, but the object that is the 2016 campaign and the object within that object, which is Donald Trump and his campaign are but one of the reasons why this is an extraordinary moment. We live in a time right now where all of the givens are no longer given. And there is a part of that that is incredibly exciting. And people in this room who are drawn, for instance, to the calls for a political revolution coming from Bernie Sanders, People in this room who have not only been called to, but have issued the call that hashtag Black Lives Matter are part of this. People who are saying that we are no longer in the shadows or need to hide and bury our identities as transgender, as undocumented, as people who previously were on the margins, if at all, on the page of American storytelling. For all of those people, in a great way, givens are no longer given. The things that we used to accept, we don't accept anymore. But there, of course, is a more challenging and troubling side as well to the ways in which all the things that used to be given aren't given anymore. It's no longer a given in the United States that when a president is elected, that both the winning party or the winning candidate's campaign and the losers will still agree on the legitimacy of the political system of the United States and the legitimacy of the result and will agree that what happens after should be, okay, you won one, we'll play, we'll play another round. It's no longer a given. It's no longer a given that institutions, whether they are educational institutions or industrial institutions, that used to provide a modicum of security and a pathway forward for what you thought your notion of opportunity and your notion of the American dream might be, it's no longer a given that any of those institutions, any of those pathways are going to exist for you. Right? We live in a time where 
Hierarchies are collapsing, institutions are caving in, networks are sprouting up and bypassing and overtaking the rubble of these fallen institutions. And as I say, there's beauty to this and there's fear in this. And this is the moment right now. And it's very easy in a moment like this. In fact, it's so easy that it's exactly what our presidential campaign is right now. It is very easy in a moment like this to get on this, it's not a sugar high, it's a bile high. On a bile high, man, I love feeling fired up about those evil fill in the blanks, right? So for some of the folks who are inclined to vote for Trump, those evil Mexicans who are taking their jobs, those evil Chinese who are rigging the game, those evil people on welfare who are ripping us off, for people who are in the Sanders camp, those evil people on Wall Street, those evil folks. It is a bile high that we get right now, the satisfaction of a visceral dehumanization of somebody else. And look, if there's one thing that this moment calls upon us to do, calls upon us to do, because here we are, this weird group of 500 people who decided on a beautiful Friday night to come in a dark room <laughs> and talk about serious stuff, right? We strange outliers have this special responsibility and this special opportunity right now not to give in to the cycle of dehumanization that is defining our politics right now and is defining civic life in general. And the reactions that people have had in this country to what seemed to me from the very get-go, from the moment that our, one of our next speakers and her colleagues, her comrades, created hashtag Black Lives Matter. From that moment, it seemed to me that hashtag Black Lives Matter was as self-evident a truth as there are self-evident truths in the book of American life. But there are plenty of our fellow Americans who don't see it that way. And there are plenty of our fellow Americans who don't want to engage in a conversation about who is us because they are gripped by a fear and they are giving in to that bile and they are giving in to that hatred. And there's one thing about hatred, just like there's one thing about compassion, it's contagious. And the contagion that is spreading virally from the likes of Donald Trump is one that those of us who wish to build not only a beloved community in some kumbaya sense, but wish to build the republic that we were promised just that, the republic that we were promised, those of us who want to do that have to do that in ways that are not about hate. That can be about anger, that can be about authenticity, that can be about getting very real in each other's faces about the ways in which we are eliding and evading the truths, evident or not, of racial injustice, economic inequality, marginalization, and the intersectionality of all of these causes that in this moment where givens are no longer given are able to find voice. This is the time we are in right now. And we invite you, not only this evening, but throughout the arc of our time together tomorrow, to really think about yourselves not only as, in fact, not at all as passive recipients of information, though you will get tons of wonderful, inspiring information, not only as observers, though you will observe a great, great deal, but as actors, as authors, as co-creators, as co-imaginers of this concentric set of circles that we belong to. This circle here of the 500 whatever there are of us, the circles that radiate out into the 20 some states that you all have come from around this country, the realms and domains of family and class and ethnicity and race and identity that you are part of, and to think about yourself as a catalyst, as a citizen who is trying to lead by example, 
lead by example in what it means to confront hard truths, to hear one another, to learn from one another, to push one another, to challenge one another. And that is the aim of our gathering tonight. I want to, before I introduce our keynote speaker this evening, say a few words of gratitude. Uh, first of all, you'll see on the backs of your programs a list of our partners and sponsors, which begins with Seattle Center, uh, which has been, for these 11 years, our home and our host, and um, not only a chance to enjoy this powerful civic campus that is Seattle Center, but particularly as we bring in so many friends and partners and allies from around the United States, for folks outside of Seattle to see just what it is that we have here that makes this place a unique incubator for this kind of civic imagination and civic capacity. And then uh, I want to thank as well our sponsors, which you see here, the Hewlett Foundation, Delta Airlines, Committee for Children, Seattle Foundation, the Chicago Community Trust, which we will be hearing about more tomorrow from their CEO, uh, Arizona State University, SCIU 775 Northwest, Encore.org, the Nick and Leslie Hanauer Foundation, and uh, as a presenting partner here is a program uh, that I've had the opportunity to launch at the Aspen Institute on Citizenship and American Identity. And I draw your attention to this because it often gets lost in conferences, uh, who actually made it possible for us to come together here, but uh, I, I draw your attention to it as well uh, for a different reason, uh, and that is to think of yourselves as the sponsors of what's going to happen here, yourselves as the underwriters of the, co the quality of engagement that we're about to enjoy here. The rest of this evening is going to flow as follows. Um, in a moment, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, and after she speaks, we're going to hear the first of what over the weekend will be a series of soapbox speeches. Short speeches, uh, two minutes, uh, given by students who are part of a remarkable organization called the Mikvah Challenge, based in Chicago, operating in cities around the country. <clears throat> And Mikva Challenge uh, is dedicated to a very simple uh, notion, which is action civics. The way you teach civics is you teach by doing. You empower young people to go out and do, to make the change that they wish to see in the world. Not only be the change, but to make it, and to become literate in power, and literate in how power operates in a community by trying to exercise power and figuring out what the obstacles are. So we're going to hear tonight and then throughout the day tomorrow from young people in the Mikvah Challenge. Uh, and then uh, after that, we will have a panel uh, discussion uh, that will include our keynote speaker as well as three other remarkable folks who I'll introduce to you uh, in a moment about this movement moment that we're in right now. Uh, and then uh, with another soapbox speech, we will then, uh, after that, close uh, with a presentation. Those of you who here, were here with us last year um, got to encounter some of the remarkable young people who are part of an organization uh, called Youth Build and who from that platform uh, created something called the National Council of Young Leaders. And from that platform have begun to imagine a new voice, a new place, a new way for people in this country, young people, often young people of color who are out of work and out of school, who are, in the word that Nikita used, who are often discarded or looked at as to be discarded, how they've been able to find voice and place and leadership in community and country. 